turn over to Micah, if you would, 7th chapter, uh, we left off at verse 5 last week. In verse uh, chapter 5, of course, we had uh, been introduced to the uh, birth of the Messiah, going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephratah, <clears throat> and and this is introduction of the spiritual Jerusalem that is to come. And he, uh, Micah talks about, in these later verses, about the spiritual uh, remnant, spiritual Jerusalem. Of course, he does go into other matters also. In verse chapter 6, <clears throat> he presents uh, really a... Uh, um, kind of a court case and he says there to you know to Judah plead your case plead your case and the jury is going to be the mountains and the hills since they have been here since the very beginning and so they couldn't bring an accusation. And so since they couldn't answer the, you know, what the charges that they had against God, then they almost, uh, almost uh, tried to figure out exactly what could they do to gain God's favor again. And they make a steady progression from the very simple, bound down, offering calves, uh, thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil. It's a, it's a progression. And then they get to the uh, sacrifice of their firstborn, which is an abomination to the Lord, even to suggest that. But it's all a progression of uh, things that they could do, but these were all outward manifestations. It did not reflect their heart. And so in verse 8 of chapter 6, he says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and good is it has uh, defined by his word, and good in, in essence is doing his will for the reason he said do his will. He says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Uh, that's the idea of justice. You do things right because they are right. And to love mercy or, or uh, be kind towards uh, those uh, of your fellow man. You want mercy yourself, so you know, show mercy to others. And be kind and, and loving towards your fellow man. And to walk humbly with your God, this uh, notion of walking humbly with your God means to uh, walk with Him with a proper attitude and a penitent uh, spirit, uh, to do His will because it is it is His will. And walking is always a a manner of uh, conduct. So, and then. Down in verse 10, God pleads with them. Are there yet wickedness in your household and things like that? And uh, you know, they were still guilty. So he's still going to uh, uh, punish them for this. And down in uh, chapter 7, he says, woe is me, and that's Probably, if you're talking about these people that are that have uh, going to be punished, they're the ones probably saying, "Woe is me! <laughs> it's going to be bad for them." He said, "I'm like uh, summer fruits, and summer fruits, um, what I understand that time is is those that are kind of beyond ripe." 
and like those who gather vintage grapes, there's no cluster to eat and so forth. Um, it says in verse 2, no, no upright among men. There's no one uh, honest here. And uh, these people all lie in wait for blood. Every man, every man hunts his uh, brother with a net. You know, when they were out birding, you know, they would use nets to catch the birds. And, and, and he likens man hunting his brother to somebody uh, trying to catch birds. And they do, uh, they do evil with both hands. You know, if you really want to be good at something, you know, get your, both hands into it. And so they were doing evil with both hands. And they names the three principal uh, practitioners of evil, and they're doing it different ways, of course. Prince, that's the, the political leader, the king, if you want to call it that, political leaders of the time, they asked for gifts. You know, they're not satisfied with just, you know, I, I guess they get taxes and all government officials get taxes, but they want, wanted more than that. If you wanted a favor, I need a gift. And the judge, who is supposed to be the arbiter of law between contesting or contending parties, they ask for the bride. And the one who gives the bride is a bride is... Uh, or the bribe is the one that's going to win the court case. And the great man, be a rich man, he utters his uh, evil desire. So he may be the one behind it all. He's bribing the judge and, and the uh, also making uh, available the gifts to the prince. But they're all scheming together to achieve a, uh, a nefarious end, an evil end. The best of them is like a briar. We were, that's where we left off last time, a briar. And I never could figure out the name of that uh, briar. It could be bull briar. And it, there's uh, quite a few varieties of briar in the United States, but if you ever get caught up on one of these briars, you don't need a name. <laughs> you know what it is, and it will tear you up. And it says the day of your watchman. Yeah, you remember in Ezekiel and a couple of places there is talking about the watchman. He has a responsibility that when danger comes, he's supposed to warn the people. And if he doesn't, he he's the one that's going to be guilty. If he does warn them and they don't do anything, then uh, you know he's not guilty of their blood. But this is the idea here: the day of your watchman and your punishment comes. The watchman's not doing his job. And so punishment's going to come. In verse uh, 5 where we left off, and during this time, it said, Don't trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom, the, the wife. Uh, the son dishonors father. Daughter rises uh, against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. During this time, don't trust anyone. There is no one that will be trustworthy. But like I said, uh, when you're talking about the prophets, yes, they will uh, prophesy destruction because of the evil and sinfulness of the people, but they always offer hope. They always offer hope. And here, in starting verse 7 through the end of the chapter, this is the promise of uh, the final salvation. And it's really talking about the uh, spiritual remnant, you know, uh, these that are taken off captivity to Babylon, a remnant's going to return, but God never promised that all of them would return. In fact, he made very clear that most of them would not return, but there'd be a, a remnant, and but given the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Messiah that's going to come through Bethlehem Ephratah, this again is referencing that. So it's talking about a spiritual remnant, not the actual physical uh, remnant. 
He says, Therefore I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the Lord, the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And do not rejoice over me, my enemy. They had a lot of enemies that uh, were rejoicing because of the destruction that was visited upon Judah. But he's saying here, don't rejoice because we're going to be the ultimate uh, victors in all this. And this is a, a very uh, comforting description of what the remnant can expect. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. And when the, these uh, people were punished, uh, this is a uh, admonition to take your punishment. You're being punished because of your sin. Take it and then get on with your uh, uh, life. Because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. Well, if God is uh, punishing these people, has he pleading their case? What's well, the nature of God? You know, God really doesn't want to punish anyone. But because he is God and he has to be true to his nature, he has to punish people that are engaged in sin and will not repent. But he's going to make a plea for their case to restore them to a uh, position of, of righteousness. Of course, it's all dependent upon their repenting. But he will be their best advocate to, uh, for restoration. He will bring me forth to the light, and I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? And that's what people were saying, that, you know, your God is powerless to act, but he will act. My eyes will see her, now she will be trampled down like mire in the streets. So all these uh, naysayers and the other nations, they're the ones that, that are going to be uh, utterly and totally destroyed. In the days when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria and fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, uh, from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. So these people into the new Jerusalem are going to come from all over. Yet the land shall be desolate. Even though the spiritual Jerusalem will be uh, built whenever the day of restoration comes and whenever the day of the Messiah comes from Bethlehem, Ephrathah. But st still the land is going to be uh, desolate. When they're taken off into captivity, uh, there's no one to tend to the land except just a few people. And the land's going to be des desolate. So when it comes to uh, sin and the consequences of sin, there are a lot of innocent uh, creatures that suffer because of it. Maybe, maybe the animals, maybe, you know, the... Uh, uh, cultivation of land that may suffer. Sin has a much more widespread effect than just the one who's engaging in the sin. He says, shepherd your people with your staff. And if you're uh, King James, it probably says with your rod. Uh, and that's the idea of, you know, your shepherd has a rod, a staff something to kind of knock the sheep on the head, but it, that's part of the shepherding function. So here he's saying that, again, going back to the uh, uh, Messiah from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he said, shepherd your people and the flock of your heritage who dwell solitarily in a woodland. Now, dwelling solitarily in a woodland means that they're... Um, 
they're separate, you know, come, come out from among them, be ye separate, you know, that kind of idea. So they're to be separate in the midst of Carmel. Carmel is that uh, little piece of land, I guess, it may be present-day Lebanon, I'm not sure, but it kind of juts out into the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and it's very uh, fertile, very lush. But it's surrounded by ocean, uh, sea on both sides, so it's isolated. Again, it's the idea of separateness. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, um, very uh, fertile places, as in days of old. As in the days, or it could mean according to the days, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. And it would be marvelous things that it'd be very similar to the marvelous things that were shown the people of Israel as they were led out of Egypt, all the miracles that were done for them. Uh, so again and again, the prophets will refer to Egypt because it's such a similar event in the lives of the nation of Israel. But of all the wonders that were done there, he's going to show them marvelous, marvelous things with the, uh, this new Jerusalem. The nations, in verse 16, the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. And nations, just the uh, uh, Gentile nations, heathen nations. And in this time, they're going to be very powerful heathen nations, but they're going to be ashamed of all their might uh, under the uh, weight of this new spiritual kingdom. And they shall put their hand over their mouths. It means they don't have anything to say. They can't say anything. And their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. And they shall crawl from their holes like the snakes of the earth. They're going to be uh, uh, sort of prostrate before this Messiah that comes from Bethlehem, Ephraim. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you, this new spir spiritual Jerusalem. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity? Now, he doesn't pardon I iniquity without the uh, corresponding uh, repentance, but he is the one and the only one that can pardon iniquity. In passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, of his heritage, again, he never said that it, all of them would return. There's going to be a remnant, and his heritage is going to be the spiritual Zion, a spiritual Jerusalem. He does not retain his anger forever. He delights in mercy. In fact, not only does he delight in it, he eagerly looks forward to extending mercy where he can to be in uh, harmony with his uh, nature. He will again have compassion on us and we'll subdue our iniquities. He will create a situation where they can be uh, obedient to his will, they can have forgiveness of sins, and that's going to come under the new spiritual Jerusalem. You will cast all our sins in the, into the depths of of the sea. Sin is that which separates one from God. And those sins are that are forgiven, and they're going to be as if they never happened. They're going to be cast into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham. And Jacob and Abraham just means all the uh, uh, Jewish people. And again, we're talking about the spiritual Jewish people, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. And again, this was uh, something that was from the very beginning. It was not something that was just uh, thought up by uh, Micah. And these things had been in, in the situation from the very beginning, from the day of creation. So that ends the book of Micah.
Next book is going to be uh, Zephaniah. It's just a couple of books over if you want to pen over there. And I've got uh, some few comments about the beginning of it. Uh, Zephaniah means Jehovah hides or Jehovah is hidden. All these names of old had some sort of meaning. Just like, you know, you're talking about American Indians, they have names that mean something, uh, something from nature or what have you. You know, that was the case back in this time also. And I, actually, if you were to do an etymology of your own name, it will have some sort of meaning in antiquity. And, you know, mine is... Uh, uh, an Anglo-Saxon name, or at least the first name. We know what my last name is. <laughs> but the first name is some sort of uh, Anglo-Saxon word. And it's the same with uh, all of you also. Your name came from something in the past uh, associated with uh, either some profession or some something that had to do with uh, the character or the uh, profession, occupation of, of the people of the time. But anyway, uh, now when he was actually born, well, we uh, don't know, it probably it may have been the time of Manasseh, that was the, the uh, probably the most wicked of the uh, kings of Judah. He's the son of Hezekiah, who was a who was a good, uh, good king, and Josiah was the last good king that there was. But anyway, but really don't know, and he traces his genealogy back to Hezekiah. It's not through the uh, they make him a, some sort of grandson of Hezekiah, if that's the case. But he wasn't uh, descended through the line of kings that uh, of Hezekiah. But anyway, he, he could have been of royal blood. You know, we're just uh, basing that on what's said there. We don't know anything about him personally other than this. We don't know about his occupation. Uh, nothing indicates in the book what it might have been. We just don't know. And he may have made Jerusalem his home, you know, when he calls it in verse 4 of this place. And that may be a, a indication of familiarity with uh, Jerusalem. But again, uh, we really don't know that much about the person. And he, he wrote about the same time as uh, uh, Micah and, and some of the others, so there are a number of them that were active at the same time. As I said, there's always a political background uh, uh, with these prophets. And that's the case here also. Now, Hezekiah was the one that he's kind of described as being the grandson of, but Hezekiah was uh, succeeded by um, Manasseh. And he was probably uh, one of the, well, at least one of the more wicked rulers. Uh, may not be anybody more wicked than him, but he was a very wicked uh, ruler. He rebuilt all the star, uh, altars and reinstated the uh, Baal worship. And he was uh, succeeded by his son, Ammon. And he was just like Manasseh, an evil, uh, you know, one of great weakness. And Josiah, the son of Ammon, uh, he ascended to the throne when he was about eight years old. And age 16, he began to seek uh, Jehovah, 
uh, he had the most sweeping reforms of any attempted by any kings before him. And even though he destroyed a lot of the uh, um, altars and, and uh, high places of worship and things like that, the idol worship still continued. So, anyway, he was the one, if you recall, in the process of cleaning the temple, uh, or one of his um, or pri uh, priests or scribes, I forget exactly who it was, found a book. It was a book of the law. They hadn't read it in a long, long time. So he, they gave it to him. He read it, and it, it greatly alarmed him because, uh, you know, he was bright enough to know that they weren't following what that book said. So he sent a word to the prophetess Hulda. Now, given all the other prophets that were uh, prophesying at that time, you know, we had Jeremiah, we had uh, Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk. They were all prophets this time, but he didn't send for them, he sent for Hulda. But, yeah, you know, he, he cleansed the, the uh, temple based on this, and that was followed by the Passover, which hadn't taken uh taken place in a very long time. So he had instituted these reforms, and that, and that was good. But apparently Zephaniah was not too impressed with it. And if we read, when we read uh, Zephaniah, we see that a lot of the same practices were still going on. They may have been reformed by uh, Hezekiah, but they still had problems. During this time, of course, uh, Syria was still the uh, big dog in the neighborhood. They, they controlled everything. They had supremacy over this portion of the world. And uh, anyway, they were, Syria was able to retain their place in the, the scheme of things, but of course, uh, Babylon was on, on the rise. But whenever uh, Egypt tried to uh, assault Assyria and Hezekiah, or this time it's Josiah, he, he came to their aid and he kind of blocked it came to Assyria's aid. He kind of blocked uh, uh, Pharaoh, Necho. He blocked them. The only one little problem with his uh, blocking maneuver, he got killed in the process. So, but anyway, and you and you think about it, uh, at this time, the. Uh, I said Syria, uh, Babylon was on the rise, and they finally declared their independence from um, Assyria. And of course, you know how it is in those times. You try to be independent, and there's going to be a war. And so there was a war. And Nabopolassar was king of the Babylon, and he he's one that declared independence from uh, Assyria. And of course, this caused a war, and and. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, son, Nebuchadnezzar, led an army against uh, uh, Syria. And of course, that's when Pharaoh came up to, to help, and that's when it, uh, Judah, Hezekiah, or, or Josiah blocked uh, uh, Pharaoh from coming in and attacking uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but he got killed in the process. Anyway, but about this time, uh, 
Nebuchadnezzar's father died. And back in that time, if you wanted to claim the throne, you better be back in the place where the throne could be claimed. So when Nebuchadnezzar found out his father died, he hurried back to uh, Babylon to claim the throne. And it was during this time that he also took back uh, Brett, you know, three or four guys that you mentioned tonight. Daniel and his three companions, he took them back at that time. So we'll have to delay this until next Wednesday night, and we'll give a little more of history there. But just keep in mind, there's always a political process uh, and ongoing for all these uh, what all all these prophets' time of uh, uh, during their time of prophecy. So, thank you. We'll continue next time.